And welcome again to Theories of Reality. I'm Professor Barrowdale, and uh, today we're going to be talking about cryonics. So um, we just uh, showed the um, the film um, Immortality on Ice, and it's all about uh, cryonics. Now, why cryonics? Well, the idea uh, primarily people that are interested in cryonics don't believe in the soul. So often, um, often. Uh, dualism or sometimes idealism is pitched as yeah but uh, if you're a materialist you're gonna die if uh, you're a dualist you have some hope that even though your body will die your soul will live on and um, cryonics shows that no wait a minute the materialists have a shot at immortality too and perhaps one based on science as opposed to what's written in some old books or some subjective spiritual experiences people have had um, and we'll talk about those later, um, uh, near-death experiences. But those are still um, primarily anecdotal, subjective experiences. And um, we have purported revelations from various cultures, from superstitious eras, which um, contain a lot of other information we now know to be false. So uh, the uh, cryonicist says, let's put our, our trust in, not in uh, religion or in the soul, um, or in God, but in science. And so, um, I'm on a whiteboard here. So, uh, cryonics. Cryonics is a preferred term. Sometimes people use the word cryogenics. So, cryogenics uh, is just the science of low temperatures. So uh, cryonics is this, um, or, sorry, cryogenics is just a general term for anything that goes, at, that goes on at low temperatures. So I have a friend that used to design cryogenic systems, and they were computer-controlled industrial processes that cooled things uh, down with liquid nitrogen. So that's cryogenics. It's not cryonics. Um, so uh, uh, cryonics is cryogenics applied to human beings, and uh, sometimes, sometimes pets too. Uh, but the idea is that you take the, the, the brain and <clears throat> upon death or perhaps even shortly before, um, you cool it quickly down to a temperature of uh, um, uh, just, just above freezing. And then finally you, um, you, or you flush the body with the uh, coolants, sort of non-toxic antifreeze to minimize uh, freezing damage. And then finally, you do the descent to um, close to absolute zero, the temperature of liquid nitrogen. So um, you uh, wrap the body, again, to pro protect it from freezing damage, freezer burn, if you will. If you will. And, um, and then, uh, for all intents and purposes, you are frozen in time. Uh, you know, pun intended, I guess. You're nothing, literally nothing happens to you. When you're at that low temperature, there's no, uh, there's no decay. You take meat and you put it in the freezer, even at freezing temperatures, it's gonna last maybe six months, nine months. Um, <clears throat> depending on how fast you get it in the freezer, it's got a sh definite shelf life and it's probably less than a year. <coughs> um, but uh, when you cool something down to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, Literally, it's the case that nothing happens. There's no decomposition. There's no chemical change. Um, so whatever state you were in when you died, um, minus the freezing damage, whatever damage that might do, um, you'll be that way in uh, 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years. And the question is, is, well, what then? Well, the idea is that in the future, medicine is going to be far beyond anything we can imagine right now. And at a certain point, the technology will develop to revive and repair whatever damage the freezing's done and also fix whatever killed you, whether it's uh, heart disease, um, cancer, uh, maybe, uh, maybe even old age. And... Um, that's, that's the sort of idea behind it, so you can have physical immortality. And 
no guarantee of eternal life. I suppose there are some things to worry about way down the line, billions of years from now, when the sun sort of goes supernova or expands too much to make the Earth habitable. But by then, we'll have space travel, right? Um, maybe there's some other problems uh, about, say, um, accidents, right? So perhaps in the future, people will be extremely careful um, because it's... Um, as long as the basic structures in the brain are intact, uh, and again, this, this view assumes the mind-brain identity theory, that, or, or maybe, maybe the functionalist theory, but it assumes that as long as your brain is working, that, that you're still around. And as, if we can, even if the brain stops working for a thousand years, if we warm it up and uh, get it functioning again the way it was before, that's you. And there's no ghostly mini-me inside your head that sort of pops out the top and floats up into heaven. And then, you know, what's going to happen when you revive the person? Is it going to come back? Does it have to come back? Do you come back as a soul of a zombie? So the, the crisis generally just say, look, people come back from death all the time. It's just, we're just talking about lengthening, lengthening the, the period between death and reanimation. So in the, the film you saw, there was a, a boy that fell into a frozen lake. And uh, he uh, drowned. He's dead. They uh, pull him out after something like three hours. No heartbeat, no respiration, no brain activity. He's dead. So um, they put him on the stretcher, take him to the hospital, gradually warm his body, jumpstart his heart. And he's good as new. And he's going around walking and talking. There's no... Um, evidence that he's a soulless zombie or that uh, uh, something's wrong with him because he's been dead. Uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, he's, he's uh, the same person he was before. Uh, you saw Miles the dog. He was cooled down, not to freezing, but just above freezing. And uh, Miles the dog came back uh, and at, at time of filming. He's probably, I think he's probably in the, in the cryostasis again at, at freezing temperatures now and uh, the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Uh, wait, waiting for it to be reanimated. But when this film was done, which was in the mid-90s, he, um, uh, Miles the dog uh, had been brought just to the ice point and back and seemed perfectly okay. So if we can uh, bring uh, animals back to life and even human beings back to life after a few hours, what's the big leap between uh, and uh, difference between bringing somebody back in a few years, a hundred years, a thousand years? Um, if they're dead, uh, and and you know, this is a question, question about like what is death, and the crinosis see see death is just basically irreversible brain damage. So um, let's see. You know, maybe we'll say true death. And uh, Robert Edinger, who's the father of Cryonics, now uh, passed on in, in suspended animation. Um, Robert Edinger. He's a good name to know, by the way. He's the father of Cryonics. And he makes this interesting point. Um, and put this in the next page, he says. So he has this quote, you know, if you remember his definition of death, he says, when are you dead? You're dead when you're never revived. So whether you're dead now does not depend on your state now, it depends on your state in the future. So um, you are dead when you are never revived. So we can wait even uh, hundreds, thousands of years uh, to bring you back. Probably won't take that long. I'm guessing in a few hundred years. If you look at the, um, the exponential uh, growth of technology,
and, and especially uh, um, health technology, um, biology. Um, that, that, and, and particularly um, developments in nanotechnology. Uh, it should make a person very bullish about cryonics working. So if you're preserved under good conditions, if, uh, if you die in the hospital and the cryonics team is waiting in the wings and they set to work right away packing your body in a coffin filled with dry ice, and they medevac you in a helicopter, get you back to the facility, uh, start perfusing your body with cryoprotectants to keep uh, freezing damage from harming your cell structure. And, um, and if you choose to go head only, which is called a neuro, let's just get this down, a neuro patient, head only. So they actually, what they do is they chop off your head, or I suppose <laughs> more, more, um, you know, less gruesomely, they, they uh, surgically remove your head from your body, detach the two. And the idea is that in the future, it will be easier to grow you a new body than to fix your old body. Um, and they've done uh, experiments uh, with, uh, um, with cloning. And the idea is you can do it, you sort of clone your own body. And they've done experiments where you can clone uh, a, a human body without um, a, a higher brain. So basically, you create a clone of the patient and, um, and then, you know, probably gestated in an artificial womb. It grows up um, sitting there in a hospital bed. Maybe you kind of move it around. You have some sort of uh, exoskeleton thing to stimulate the muscles and so on and so forth. And <coughs> when it reaches a certain age, you know, 16, 18, whenever it is, uh, they can take your brain out of your old head and put it into this uh, clone that's been waiting for you and attach all of the nerves and um, and there you are uh, good as new and so you'll have a, a new body um, and that's probably easier to do like, remember there's that um, that old guy who's like uh, 80 years old and he says uh, um, uh, I've got heart disease I've got I've got two vessels that are 75 percent blocked one vessel that's 50% blocked, another one that's 25% blocked. And if I have to go into the future with this body, I'll be in, uh, I'll be in rough shape to begin with. And so the idea is that, no, he's not going to have to go in there with his old wreck of a body. His brain's still in good shape. You can tell the guy's still sharp. And um, so the idea is you take the brain out of the skull and put him in the body of a 16-year-old, 18-year-old clone of himself. So it's like being young again. Um, so that's the... That's the idea. So, um, uh, headless clone experiments. There was one of those, one of the comedy shows. I wish, I'll see if I can dig that up. I post it to Moodle if I can find it. Um, might have been Saturday Night Live, and they're really jealous about their copyright, and it's hard to find clips of their stuff on, on, uh, on the video sites, maybe on NBC or something. They had this thing, um, I think it was, it was, it was, uh, it might have been Saturday Night Live, and they have, um, let's see, Headless Clone, right here, Headless Clone Experiments. And uh, I think mostly in frogs, although they might have done higher animals now. Um, but there was this, it's sort of like, it was, a, it was a fake infomercial for having your own headless clone farm, and it shows all these headless people sort of wandering around. So it's not going to be like that. So the idea is that what makes you conscious, it's your, um, your cerebral cortex, right? It's the, the higher part of your brain. Your brain stem, your medulla oblongata, just controls your animal instincts, the fight or flight response autonomic nervous system, like heartbeat, respiration. Um, so if you clone a body and it just has those things, it's not like you're killing a person. So in order to have a person, you need um, higher consciousness, a uh, fully developed brain. Um, so it's sort of like you're creating a brain-dead version of you, right? So when a person has catastrophic brain damage, their, um, their uh, frontal cortex shows no activity, and they're just, um, their heart's beating, and uh, their, um, their blood's pumping. <coughs> Lungs are functioning. 
but really nothing else is going on, uh, usually what they do is you know, pull the plug. Because uh, and sometimes these people come back, but they can usually tell. Like if if the the damage is just catastrophic, they can say, well, there's no way this person will ever come back, and so there's no reason to keep that person uh, alive. So you are appropriating a life, but you're not killing a person. So the idea there aren't really is that there aren't really any ethical problems with this because um, you know, you're a person, but this clone is just uh, it's just a body. It's a body without a person. So um, so uh, some people are just will go whole body. The whole body is a little easier to do. You can't concentrate as much on the brain. So um, again, there's this idea that the mind is the brain or that the mind is a function of the brain. So what you want to do is really focus on whether you're doing everything you can do to preserve the brain. And you don't really care about your toes, right? You can, you're going to be able to you're going to get new toes, you could get new feet, you can get a whole new body. And if you obsess on saving your extremities and then you don't do as good a job on saving the brain, then that's going to be bad. You might lose some memories, you might um, you know, have some problems with intellectual capacity. Um, and some of those things might be fixable too. But there are certain things like memories that are really, they really seem to be a part of what makes you you, as we talked about in the, the personal identity section. So it's really important to hold on to the memories and character and all those things that make you unique. Because um, otherwise, why not just like have a clone, right? Get a full body clone, get some of your genetic material. Um, and I'll make this point now, you know, a clone, a clone is not you. Uh, I, I have an identical twin brother who's up here for a visit uh, this past Christmas. And, um, and he's a genetic duplicate of me. Now, technically speaking, you get um, changes in, in uh, DNA over time. Um, and so the older you get, the more divergent you are. But pretty much, he's, he's a genetic duplicate of me. He looks like me, sounds like me, walks like me, talks like me, has some of my mannerisms even, um, shares my sense of humor, my musical ability. So there's a lot in common that due to our common uh, genes, but we're also very different people. We disagree on politics, uh, taste in music. Uh, we live very different lifestyles. He's an accountant. I'm a philosopher. I mean, how far apart can those things be? Um, so, so we're different people, and we have different you know centers of consciousness. So all a brain is it's a vehicle for consciousness. It's not. Your DNA isn't what makes you who you are. It's an influence in, on personality and some uh, and you know in, intellectual capacity and ability, but uh, you know the memories are really important. And until we can figure out how to you know take memories from one brain and put it in another, you're looking at a brain transplant. Um, and if you do this experiment, like what um, suppose um, I don't know we have two clones, right? And um, let's see. You could either say, um, you have a choice about whether you would um, have, uh, a, uh, some evil scientist says, you're, one, of the, one, of the, the, one of these clones is going to be tortured. And we're going to put your brain into one of the clones. The other clone is going to get the brain he was given from birth. And then we're going to torture one. So, and he asks you, who would you like to be tortured? And let's assume you're making like a selfish choice. A self-interested choice. Most people would say, well, Torture, torture the clone that doesn't have my brain. Why? Because that's not me. I'm, I'm me as far as my brain goes. That's, that's, um, that's all my memories and experiences. Locke calls it continuity of consciousness. So that's really who I am as a person. It's my memories, my character, and all those experiences that I had when I was me before. And so the idea is I'm the same person as the person that you know, rode his tricycle down the slide and imitation of daredevil, evil, Knievel, you know, back in the Stone Age, right, in the 70s. Um, and um, yeah, why am I that person? Well, it's because I can remember doing it. And so um, if you're a realist about personal identity, then it seems that you would want, um, you, you, yeah, a clone's not going to be good enough. Uh, why would you? Why should you care that someone with your DNA exists today? 
it's not really another version of you. People kind of fool themselves into thinking that if they have kids, that it's sort of a way of surviving. But, you know, you're going to traumatize your kid if you're thinking about them as a mini-me. <laughs> um, it's not, not going to be good for their psychological development at all. So um, they aren't miniature versions of you. They share your DNA, but they're totally different people. Um, so a clone would not be you. So again, the idea is that we go look, grow a clone body and uh, transplant your brain in there. And then the nanotechnology, which I mentioned a moment ago, nanotech. You fix the freezing damage. And, you know, you're good as new. And then also, um, you know, fixes for other diseases in the future. Yeah, it's hard to know what the future will bring, but you can kind of extrapolate, right? So um, think about what medicine was like 150 years. Um, antiseptic surgery was just, you know, we're not really even around um, until after the Civil War. <coughs> A lot of soldiers died of infections because the doctors didn't even know to wash their hand. The germ theory of disease didn't even uh, come at them to its forefront. And, you know, pasteurizing milk and foods, food safety measures and all that stuff is really 19th century. The Industrial Revolution didn't come about until the 19th century. So we were thinking about like maybe a hundred years and change that we've lived in in anything other than like an agrarian economy where a bunch of farmers and and maybe some some traders and a, a merchant class and some craftsmen who would make all their goods by hand, right? So maybe let's say 150 years, right? So 150 years of modern civilization. Well, um, it's not it's not like you add 100, another 150 years and you get that far. Uh, technology is expanding exponentially. So the more we learn, the faster we're able to advance technology. And artificial intelligence is going to increase this even more. And so the rate of, of the increase in technology is going to be faster and faster. So you look at even since you know the 90s, we have uh, uh, ubiquitous cell phones. I remember when I was... Again, way back in the, the dark ages, I remember when people were carrying out pagers, for God's sake. And, uh, and in the 80s, you know, people, a few rich people had car phones. They're like these big, giant gizmos with an antenna on them that, you'd, um, that would be really expensive to talk on and really expensive to buy. And um, you can see, like, media technology going from the A-track take, tape to the... Um, to the, the VHS cassette, uh, which is kind of a dinosaur thing now, to uh, DVDs, and now everything's online, streaming video in the cloud, and DVDs are sort of, uh, you know, and CDs are kind of going the way of the dinosaur. And so you can see all, in all these areas, computers, um, I got one of the, I didn't get a computer until I was in high school, uh, well, sorry, college. It was my, I think it was my second year of college. And I typed my first year in college, I typed my papers on a manual typewriter. Um, and then I think I, um, I got like an electric typewriter. Ooh, that was fancy. If I made a mistake, I'd have to hit the backspace and take this little piece of paper and put it in there or get some white out and white it out and then hit the letter again. Um, and it just cut my time for writing papers in half. I had a Commodore 64. It was called the Commodore 64 because it had 64 kilobytes of memory. If you think about 64 kilobytes, how small that is. <coughs> That's the size of like a text file, and that was the total memory for this computer. So now you look at graphics, and you look go to the movies and see all the amazing things they can do with visual effects. And just, you think about this, this, this has really just happened the last few decades. And you have genetic engineering, nanotechnology, um, cures for cancer. My uh, nephew got leukemia when he was about two or three. And um, in the past, he'd just be a goner. They'd put him in hospice care. Um, and now they have these new forms of chemo, and uh, they work really well. And he's in full remission and expected to live a long life, a normal lifespan. 
um, and we have MRIs to try to figure out what's wrong with you. And so all these things are just you know, recent developments. So technology is going to increase more and more and more until uh, you know, we're going to have our flying cars and you know, all that stuff. Right? So, and don't you want to see that? Well, isn't that going to be cool? So that's, that's the, the, the increasing um, rate of technology. So exponential, um, let's see. Uh, I have this one. Oh, um, exponential. This is the idea of that things aren't just increasing, but the rate of increase is increasing. So the idea is um, you get sort of like an arith. Medic uh, increase. It's just sort of like like that, and and exponential increase. It's like that, right? It's a short period of time, and the curve just goes up until it's you know getting pretty really really steep, and so uh, technology is doubling. Think, uh, processing power is, is doubling every every few years. So that you look at just processing power as one measure of technology, that's a good example. Um, so <clears throat> don't be like a person who would say, who used to say things like, you know, if God had intended man to fly, he would have given him wings. And people actually said that and meant it. People used to scoff at the idea of putting a man on the moon. Um, people uh, used to uh, not like this idea of... Um, um, anesthetic during childbirth because they saw um, pain in childbirth as God's curse from the book of Genesis. Um, so you can see people always view new technology with suspicion. Um, they worry about it. They worry about it. You know, anything that's strange and new is, is looked on with a, a jaundiced eye. So the, uh, um, but people get over it. Like for example, this is a good, good example that fits right, right in with chronics. So I imagine there's, there's probably at least one um, person in uh, our class who was conceived in a Petri dish. Right? You do those biology, biology experiments, you have those little dishes where you put things on a slide. Well, um, people that have problems um, conceiving children will do artificial insemination. And they'll take sometimes a donor sperm if there's something wrong with their partner's a sperm or maybe they don't have a partner. In this brave new world, right? You don't need necessarily a a, a life partner and, and or one of the opposite sex, um, and so if you're a same sex couple or um, you want to be a single parent, and um, you you and you don't want to have sex with a stranger, you can uh, put the sperm and the egg together in a petri dish, and then suppose you're in the middle of college, you're not ready to have a kid. Well, you can take it and you can put it in the deep freeze. And these eggs keep uh, at the temperature, again, of liquid nitrogen. They keep indefinitely. So um, that's cryonics, right? Now, that seems to me like that's proof in concept, right? So they take the egg out. Maybe it's been in there seven years. You already have a kid. It's you know, going towards the chains. Uh, maybe not. It's going to be, you're not going to be able to have, be pregnant. And so um, implant the egg in, in uh, the woman's womb. <coughs> And uh, it grows, and, and it's just nor like a normal pregnancy, but it started out in a Petri dish. And back in the 70s, when this first started out, people would call them test tube babies. And, um, and now people just say, oh, in vitro fertilization, it's no big deal. And uh, even the Catholic Church thinks it's okay. So um, it's... Uh, uh, and now it's completely normal, and it's seen as just like you know going to the dentist. It's not anything weird. It's just technology doing its thing and uh, giving people the ability to do things they couldn't do before. It's like uh, Viagra, right? It's uh, or you know heart medi medication. And this is another point too: is is that um, um, you can think about cryonics as um, no different from other uh, life-saving, life-saving 
or life extending technology. Oops, it's a funny eye. Life saving or life extending technology. People say, oh, well, necronics, it's like you're bringing back the dead. Well, um, what do you call it when like somebody has a heart attack and you administer CPR? Um, what do you call it when you um, uh, grab a drowning victim and, and uh, did the same? Or uh, what do you call the, chemo, the chemotherapy, right? So you, you go into the hospital, you got cancer, you go chemo or radiation therapy, and you get a new lease on life. You look at uh, Larry King. Larry King's still doing his podcast, and he's like, I think he's uh, in his, maybe his 80s now. Like, he had a heart attack in the 90s and retired from TV, and he's still doing, he was still doing radio for a while. He uh, married this hot young wife, had another kid, or maybe two, right, with his wife half his age, and, and made some lifestyle changes, stopped smoking. He had quintuple, quintuple bypass surgery, which is, you know, really serious. And, you know, at the time, um, fairly new procedure. And um, he's walking, talking, doing well, last I looked. Um, and even though he, and he's, you know, enjoying his, uh, his children, his grandchildren, and his family, and he's doing a little podcast online, and, and uh, you know, keeping up with the times. And so if you think that it was okay for Larry King to get his quintuple bypass surgery, why is it, why would it be wrong for someone to freeze themselves if they have cancer or some sort of unpredictable thing, like a brain tumor that maybe is inoperable? Why not just buy some time and uh, do the operation in 200 years? They, they actually have, and this, they talked about this in the, um, in the, the, in the movie, uh, uh, Immortality on Ice, as if it were a future thing. And at the time it was. There was a guy, I don't know if you remember, I think he's like in front of the Hudson River or something. And he's wearing like these big thick black gloves and kind of going like this all the time. And he's talking about someday uh, we'll be able to do these operations where we uh, take the heart and we stop it and we, we uh, fix what's wrong with you and then we start the heart again. And he compared uh, surgery now to trying to work on an automobile while it's running. And he says, uh, what we, we can do is we can stop the heart cool, uh, or cool down the body, stop the heart, do the operation, like say an aneurysm, where you have a, a, a blood vessel in your, your brain that's about to explode uh, and rupture and, and you get a stroke uh, and probably kill you, right? So the, the idea is you see that on the brain scan or something and you have terrible headaches and they look and it looks like, a, um, looks like it's gonna be, um, that you're gonna have this stroke. And so they cool you down, kill you, take out all your blood, fix the aneurysm, repair the blood vessel, put the blood back in you, uh, warm you up, start your heart, and there you go. And he's like, in the future, we'll be able to do that. And the future arrived. And uh, in, this, uh, in, in uh, another video you're gonna watch, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a life, it's about life after death. Um, and there's a woman uh, who actually um, had that, that procedure done. And so now they can do that. And so she had an aneurysm, and um, they uh, did they they cooled down her body, uh, stopped her heart, drained the blood out, put in this blood substitute, fixed the fix her blood vessel, and she was dead for maybe ninety minutes, two hours, something like that. Um, put her blood back in, warmed her up, started her heart, and again, good as new. So. Um, the, the body is like a machine, and as long as all the parts are working, you're you, you're alive, life is good, um, and it seems like the, the sort of uh, uh, engineering challenges, the bioengineering challenges, seem like they're things that, that um, technology can handle. Now, there's the, the big thing, this is that the, the cryobiologist talks about the guy that's working on the frogs. Um, he talks about uh, the ice point. So this is sort of a practical problem. Um, the ice point. 
once you get to freezing, all sorts of things happen. You have the cell um, starts to, um, well, you get the moisture in the cell rushes um, to be outside. So it's, um, and I don't know, the, the, maybe a physics major could explain exactly how this works. But you think about like condensation, right? So you have um, uh, condensation in your windshield, um, or like you think about a glass that sweats on the outside, right? So that's, that's, um, that's an effect of the ice cubes inside the glass. And as the, the air warms it, the glass goes, the, the, the water goes to that perme perm permeable uh, membrane in the glass and, and wants to be outside. And so in, um, in a cell, you get the, uh, the contents of the cell, the water in the cell, um, as, as things freeze down, tries to go outside and form ice crystals and it weakens the cell, and then ice crystals come in, and they're pointy, and they can, can puncture the cell, and the contents leak out, and you're a big mess. Um, so, but, but the idea is that um, we have cryoprotectants, and they're getting better and better every year. Um, there's, uh, they're sort of like, again, uh, non-toxic antifreeze, or less toxic. And they, um, you look at the way frogs deal with this. They, have, they secrete these sugary substances. It's mostly glucose. And what it does is it sort of rounds the crystals um, so they don't puncture the cells. Now, frogs have evolved to do this over millions of years. Uh, human beings were trying to do this artificially. And, you know, we start out, and it's going to be sort of a trial and error. But the idea is over time, we're going to get some really good cryoprotectants. And, and perhaps people, you know, right now who have what we got, it does some good. Maybe we can fix the rest with nanotechnology. So it's not like trying to turn hamburger back into a cow. Um, and you, as you saw with like the rat case, right? You had that rat who, um, or a hamster or a gerbil, I, some rodent, right? He's, uh, he's, he's frozen solid. My guy's got his little uh, thing. He's like tapping the head, tapping the foot, you know, this guy's frozen. And then he um, warms him up, brings him back. And you know, the, the rodent dies, but he's, he's uh, alive for two hours. So that's, that's pretty darn good. And this is, again, back in the mid-90s, con you know, constantly doing experiments um, on uh, freezing and working with different cryoprotectants and, and trying to figure things out. You saw the rabbit heart um, that started beating again. And so you know, things are, are moving along. And the, the longer things progress, the, more, you know, the better the outlook's going to be. So. Um, <coughs> And particularly for, for um, students in this class who are sort of traditional college age, uh, you may, you may um, have a great shot at not even having to be frozen. You might sort of leapfrog in the future. But if something should happen, um, it's likely that at least by the time you get to retirement age, um, we can put you in a deep freeze and bring you out when we figure out how to fix you. And again, maybe, for, uh, maybe just be in there for a few years um, maybe, uh, maybe for a century, depending on what you had. Because there are many diseases now that are incurable, things like you know, Alzheimer's or Lou Gehrig's disease, um, things that will, um, we can sort of arrest and treat, but eventually you're going to attack the brain and, and um, lead to irre irreversible brain damage or, or death. And so um, we could stop those, those diseases, those progressive diseases like Alzheimer's, and um, put you in the deep freeze, and then once we have a cure, we can bring you back out to treat you. Um, so there's no upper limit on how long you can live. Uh, it'd just be a matter of uh, avoiding things like you know, being blown up by terrorists or, um, I don't know, um, don't, you know go, don't get a job, you know, cleaning out the, crema the ashes in the crematorium, so you might press the button by accident while you're in there. And then there's, you know, if, you, if your brain sort of mashed or, or exploded or something, or you're in, you know, in a spaceship and, and they lose the uh, airlock and you know, you're exposed to the vacuum of space, probably no chance for you. But you, know, you slip in the bathtub, as long as it's not the hot, sticky July, and uh, your corpse isn't sitting there you know, at room temperature or, or, or more for a weekend, you're probably going to be, be OK. And uh, in the future, there might even be little you know, cryo, cryo emergency uh, uh, things like phone booths. <laughs> Maybe that's what they'll do with the old phone booths, right? Um, so they'll, uh, 
they might just be able to even have a station there where you can sort of drop somebody in there if they're dead and uh, till the EMTs get there. And it may be that the you know, emergency vehicles will be outfitted with uh, cryonic uh, devices as well. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, I'll maybe deal with some objections. So one, um, well, overpopulation. And a lot of these objections are deal dealt with in Ben Best's article that I have in the text there. Um, overpopulation is a localized problem. And it's a problem for basically backwards um, socialist countries with no economy to speak of. Um, and um, nothing to trade. And so these are typically places where there's political instability. They're being ruled by you know, Marxist or totalitarian governments. Um, they don't allow foreign investors in. And so, and, you know, or sometimes foreign investors are afraid to go in because there's no stability and there's no property rights. So one of the reasons why places like the US and Western Europe to a lesser extent and Japan to a lesser extent um, are, are doing so well and places like um, Sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East or um, even Latin America aren't doing so well. It's, it's, all, it's all economic systems. It's not, it doesn't have to do with the physical capacity to produce food. We can produce plenty of food. It's just that we have these uh, governments that control commerce, control labor. You have unions in the U.S. that try to keep out foreign products, um, prop up prices of, of things like sugar, um, and and uh, produce and keep out foreign competitors um, and uh, don't want our jobs going overseas to, to, to somebody that wants to run a call center or something. And you know that, that stuff is changing with globalization. I see that as a very positive thing. But overpopulation, basically, once you, um, once you, uh, your, develop, your economy starts to develop, there's not really a need to have lots of kids. So why do people have lots of kids in these underdeveloped countries? Why is the birth rate in most of Western Europe um, either zero population growth or negative? And why is it about 2.2 in the US? And, um, uh, but why is it, you know, why do people have 10 kids in India? Well, you have an agricultural population. You need lots of manual labor to work on the farm. And, you know, there's also, there's not a lot, lot to do and you don't, maybe don't have a, a retirement system, and so your kids are your retirement. And there's not readily available birth control, maybe there's some religious things that get in the way. Underdeveloped countries tend to be more traditionally religious and socially conservative. Um, so um, as a country modernizes and industrializes, the birth rate comes down. So as India and China and Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, as they move in the 21st century, as their economies start to develop, um, that they, um, they're able to make things, to trade with other people. Um, people start getting middle-class jobs, health care. Um, they start uh, enjoying a larger standard of living. And then they think, well, I could have another kid or I could like buy a big screen TV. <laughs> And uh, hey, I got my 401k. Uh, why do I want another mouth to feed? And that's just a natural progression of things. So, population is going to top out at a certain point, maybe I don't know, 10 or 11 billion. It'll be fine. We could take the whole population of the, the world and and put it in uh, you know, the state of Texas with sort of suburban density, and it'll be fine. Um, so, um, there were some people. There was this guy Paul Ehrlich in the 70s one of these doomsayers that was talking about massive famine and starvation. And actually, those things are, uh, are um, part of the past now. You see them, in, and again, in, in uh, politically unstable peace places like the Middle East, but uh, you really don't see um, problems with the uh, um, overpopulation uh, um, you know, as far as the carrying capacity of an area, except for in these subsistence farming sort of areas where um, the next drought could you know, lead to massive uh, starvation. Or places like North Korea, where you have a, a dictator who's fat and all his cronies are fat, but people have to eat grass because there's nothing to eat and 
uh, food is used as a weapon. Um, in uh, areas of uh, free market capitalism and free exchange and global trade, people do really well. Um, so, and they can have as many kids as they want. Um, and the main thing to remember, like if you're in the US, wait, wait till you get through school um, and uh, develop a, a trade or, or get into a good job before you start thinking about having kids. Save a little money, right? So you're not on the public dole, so you can um, be self-sufficient and so on. Um, okay, so that's enough on, on overpopulation. All the, all the nonsense from Paul Ehrlich in the, his book, The Population Bomb, has just been abysmally wrong. And, and famines, there's, there, you don't have famines in China and India anymore because of their embrace of a, a more capitalist model of production. Um, religious objections. Um, I suppose these are as good as, you know, the religions have proof for them, and maybe that might be a mixed bag. And again, based on uh, old books from superstitious eras. Subjective, subjective experiences. That's not really a, a thing you want to put your faith in. And um, maybe you, know, you go to church and hope for the best, hope for the resurrection. But maybe you could see Cranach's as sort of insurance. <coughs> Another thing to consider is... Um, Maybe, uh, you know, do religious people get chemotherapy? Yes. Do religious people go to the doctor? Yes. Do they go to the dentist? Um, do they get, you know, bypass surgery? And it seems like they do that just like everybody else. Maybe you get some people on the fringe that stay away from doctors, but that's like a really small minority. Most, most religious people take advantage of technology to extend their lives, to be healthier, um, and stick around here to be with their family and friends and loved ones, and they see uh, medicine as being you know, God's gift to mankind. So why not see Cranix as, as part of that? Um, oh, one other thing about the old overpopulation thing. There's really like, you know, it's, there's so few people signed up for Cranix. It's, it's a kind of a fringe movement. It's gaining steam, but it's still... Um, fringe movement and it's maybe I think at the in the 90s when some of the stuff came out you had maybe like a, about a, maybe a thousand people or less less signed up at the time maybe today it's like you know 10,000 I'm not sure what the number is I'm pretty sure it's less than 10,000 that's just a drop in the bucket. If you really care about overpopulation, adopt a third world child or don't have kids of your, of your own, if you think that's a problem. Um, and I, I would challenge you to, to find some good empirical evidence that overpopulation is a global environmental problem as opposed to a political problem or a uh, economic problem. Um, okay, uh, third. Third objection, or population. Oh, this, this idea is a sort of uh, selfish, and it's for the elite. Selfish. Uh, it's a sort of uh, elitism or something. And then uh, only, only for the for the wealthy. I'll put rich here because. Well, it's too long. Only for the rich. You know, it's sort of this is the, the, I think about this as being like the, the Occupy objection or something. And uh, this, this seems like a kind of a weak um, argument to me. Because is it selfish to want to get bypass surgery? Bypass surgery costs, I don't know, like probably you're looking at $50,000. Right, um, that's a lot of money. That could feed hungry children. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we spend most of our healthcare dollars on people who are in their last six months or year of life. So um, that that sort of uh, um, you know things costing lots and lots of money 
is a feature of our system. And one of the reasons why healthcare costs are going up is that we're able to do so many more new things and new technology you know, has its costs. Um, the other reason is a sort of government intervention and you know, price controls and those sorts of things. Um, but is it selfish to want to live as long as you can? It seems I would make the argument, it's my right, uh, it's my right to die, but I also have a right to live. I have a right to life. And you know, no government or individual can deprive me of that life. And if I want to um, freeze my uh, brain and hope for the best and come back in, in the future, then that seems like that's my right. And to deny me that right um, is, would be the equivalent of murdering me. And it seems like that, that, would, be, that would be wrong. And if you think you're know, pulling the plug in a patient who wants to live um, against their, their explicit wishes is wrong, um, just because you're trying to save money, um, that, that, that seems, if you think that's wrong, that seems like getting in the way of chronics is, is like that too. Um, yeah, another objection, religious, selfish. Um, oh, there's sort of, um, yeah, will, will the, what's in it for the chronics organization? So, uh, will, will they revive you? Um, and then the, what about, you know, pandemic, World War Three? you know, all these, uh, the, you know, the big bull-eyed, it's a big asteroid hitting the earth, et cetera. Well, you know, there's not, nothing certain in life. Uh, so he pays your money and takes your choice. This seems like your best bet. So um, what's in it for the Chronics organization? Well, Chronics people are really into Chronics. It, they're, it's, it's like an ideology. They care about um, themselves and their friends. They're devoted to uh, preserving life. They're like medical professionals who don't just care about money, but they care about their patients. And they think about the people that have been entrusted in their care as their patients, uh, you know, as people. And they're going to do what they can to bring them back. There's no guarantees, but they have a strong motivation to, to do so. And this idea that somebody's, you know, going to just drop all the, the corpses into a, you know, mass grave and it's all a huge scam. There's no reason for that. It's sort of a, a, a cynical assumption on the part of anybody who would suggest that without evidence. And, and generally, the people that, that are, are active in these organizations are volunteers. They... Um, they, they tend to be um, science geeks and medical professionals, and they give their blood, sweat, and tears to this ideal of uh, preserving human life and conquering death. So I think they're highly motivated. And certainly, um, you're, you're better off trusting in the chronics organization than, I don't know, Obamacare or <laughs> Uncle Sam or, or you know, all the other things that people trust every day, um, even the police, right? Uh, I think these are people that um, have a fanatical devotion to an ideal. And that's, those are the kind of people you want in your corner who are going to defend you uh, to the best of their ability because they want to be brought back too, right? It's going to cut, their turn is going to come where they're going to be sitting there in that, that um, tank next to you waiting to be reanimated. It's in their interest to uh, further the cause. Um, oh, uh, this idea is just for the rich. It's... Um, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, funded by insur life insurance, primarily. <coughs> so this is a pretty clever uh, thing to do. So you're dead, right? So you can get life insurance policy that will cover your suspension. And it may be cost... Um, Maybe, but it depends on the organization, but you figure around, um, I think 200000 for the whole body. The Chronics organization was pretty low, but those numbers are kind of outdated. I'll have to, maybe I'll see if I can post the uh, more current numbers to the, um, to the forums. Um, but you're dealing with less than $200,000. I think you can do it for fifty still if you go um, whole body through the Chronics Institute. Alcor, maybe it's more closer to two hundred, And then you can get some extra life insurance. So um, if you have extra life insurance, then there's a miracle of compound interest. 
so you'll come out as a you know billionaire, uh, depending how long you're in there. And you think about um, trusts, um, legal mechanisms. The uh, Nobel Prize is still around, even though Alfred Nobel is long dead. There was a trust established in his name. You can establish a trust. Money is going to be waiting for you when you come out again. Um, you can have a contract with the Crianx organization to uh, hold on to your money and, you know, and look after it. So there's lots of things you can do practically. So this doesn't seem like a, a serious objection. So um, you know, will you come back as a soulless zombie? Well, again, look at, um, and maybe I'll list that like a fifth thing, the soulless zombie objection. I mean, this is really the religious objection. And the idea is that we bring in someone for an operation, they die, they're brought back. Somebody dies in a hospital, they bring them back. I've known people who have died like five times and they've been brought back. Um, they don't seem to come back as soul of the zombies, even if it's been a few hours. So why should it make any difference if it's a few hours, a few years, a few centuries? If you can, death is not this sort of metaphysical state, it's a state of your body. If we can get your body going again, uh, there's never been a case where a person's body is functioning perfectly well, but they have no consciousness. And so the evidence seems to show that if you have a functioning brain, that um, consciousness reappears, the same as it was before. If there's some brain damage, then maybe there might be some impairment, depending on how bad the brain damage is. It, it might you know, be, be serious impairment, but sometimes just mild impairment and speech problems, and sometimes those things can be um, fixed and things can be relearned over time. So, um, so those are those are all the main objections to um, cranics, and and so this is the materialist version of life after death. So if you're um, if you despaired, oh, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in the soul. Uh, there's nothing but the pine box waiting for me. There's hope for you in uh, the science of cranics. So I think that will do it for uh, cranics. I'll make sure to read the section in the text, and. Um, We'll uh, next time talk some about what happens when you die. People have these near-death experiences where they see a blinding light and talk to spiritual beings. Maybe there's a spiritual world that waits for you. Maybe cryonics is a waste of money. Although it's, you know, it's 30 bucks a month or something like that if you're a young, healthy person. Maybe 50 or 60 if you're older. It depends on how much life insurance you want. Seems like a pretty rational gamble for the, the price of you know a, a deluxe pizza and beers, you could uh, have a shot at immortality. Why not? So, um, so that's it for um, so that's it for Kranich's, uh, next time on uh, near-death experiences and what evidence, if any, do 